And I was thinking this week how amazing it is all the different apps that we can use. You know, apps on our phone, apps on our tablets, apps on our computer. There are apps that at least claim to do almost everything under the sun, everything from budgeting to any other kind of organizational task that you need and keeping track of scores and news and the list goes on. I found an app a couple years ago that I was especially excited about for my iPad. It was an app that claimed for free to teach you how to speak a new language. And I was really excited about this because in college, the language I chose to learn was Norwegian which doesn't really come in handy, except two times a year, I found. When I go to the Concordia Christmas concert and the St. Olaf Christmas concert, I can sing the Norwegian hymn with great confidence. Other than that, it hasn't really come in handy. So I've done some mission trips down to Central America, and I decided, you know, it would be a lot more useful to know Spanish. So I downloaded this app, and I was all excited about it, and I'm like, every day I'm going to use this app, and there's these nice little lessons where they give you a picture, and they teach you the word, and you start to learn sentences, and there's actually a function where it has you pronounce the words, and it critiques you, which is kind of embarrassing, but I was making progress, and I'm having these grand visions that someday I'm going to go on a mission trip, and I'm going to be, you know, just doing small talk with the locals, and then I have this other vision, I'm going to go out for a great Mexican meal with my friends and family, and right when they're about to order, I'm going to say, hey, wait, I'm going to order for everyone, and I'm going to do it in perfect Spanish, so I'm ready to go. And it went really well for a couple weeks, but then something happened. I didn't open the app one day, and then it was a week, and then it was a month, and then it was long enough that the app was actually emailing me, and it's like, why haven't you opened me? Open me, por favor, and I still didn't get the message, and so my command of Spanish is basically non-existent today. And of course, the truth is, we all know this, that apps are only good when we use them. Application is everything. And you know what? I think that is a spiritual truth, too. Application is everything. You know, you can come to church every Thursday night or Sunday morning, and you can sit here for an hour, and you can sing along with the music, and you can listen to a message, and you can open up your Bible. You can even go to a Bible study during the week, or you can go into a small group. You can listen to KTIS all day long. But if all you do is listen and not apply, it doesn't really make much of a difference. Now, James, the brother of Jesus, talks about this in his book in the New Testament. He says, for anyone who hears God's word, who interacts with God's word, who sings God's word, but doesn't actually do what it says, he says they're deceiving themselves. If all you do is go through the motions, and you're starting to feel pretty good about yourself, but you go into the week, Monday morning or any other day of the week, and you don't actually put it into practice, he says, in the end, you're just deceiving yourself. Now, Jesus talked about this too in Matthew chapter 7. He gave this illustration, he says, if you listen to his words and you put them into practice, you're like a wise person who builds their house on the rock. Anyone who hears his words, anyone who reads his words, anyone who sings his words, but then puts them into practice, it's like building your house on a rock. But he says anyone who hears his words and then decides to just do their own thing, doesn't put them into practice, he says that's like a person who builds their house on sand. And when the storms come, that house is going to fall. Application is everything. We need to put into practice what God teaches us. So today, we're finishing up a series that we've been in for a number of weeks called Finding Freedom. And it's been all about moving past, living beyond our regrets. And now if you've been here at least a majority of these weeks and we've reviewed all the things that we've gone through, you might be able to give the message better than me today. But the truth is, if you're not putting these things into practice, if you're not applying them to your life, well, James would say you're deceiving yourself. Jesus would say you're, you're building your house on a bunch of sand. So in the way of review before we dive in today, and I was considering just randomly picking somebody from the audience to come up here, but 
you know, considering I might pick a visitor, it'll be kind of awkward. Um, I'll just invite you to go through the review with me. And again, if you want to plan your brunch menu or you want to, you know, pray that the Vikings don't embarrass themselves this afternoon, have at it. But we're going to go through a little bit of review at this point. A number of weeks ago when we kicked off this series, we observed that every single one of us has regrets. It's just the way it is to be a human being. We all go through life and we accumulate regrets. Now, the thing is, my regrets might not look like your regrets. They come in all shapes and sizes. What bothers one person might not bother another. But every single one of us has regrets. Now, these regrets can be often grouped into three different categories. We have regrets of action. Those are those things that we do that we're sorry about. We have regrets of inaction. Those are those things we're sorry about not doing. You know, it's missed opportunities. We could have come through for someone. We could have encouraged someone. We could have stuck up for someone, but maybe we didn't. And then we have regrets of, of reaction. And those are those things that are done to us by someone else, but they often cause us to respond in an unhealthy, an unhelpful way. Now, when we experience a regret that sticks with us, what often happens is we get stuck. It just keeps coming back again and again. And we get stuck in what's called the sorry cycle. And this is basically like having a DVR in your head and hitting replay again and again and again. And we remember the regret and how it went down, and we long for it to be different. If we could only go back in time, if we could only change what we said or did or emailed or how we interacted, things would be so much better. And so oftentimes, that's where people get stuck. In response, because of the hurt and the pain that brings, oftentimes what we try to do to cope with it is stuff it away. I'm going to try to just hide it. I'm going to put it below the surface. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want anyone else to know about it. It's too embarrassing. It's too painful. But the problem is, at just the wrong time, our regrets begin to surface. Suddenly, our secret is out. And then we have to deal with it, and it's that much more painful. So throughout this series, as we've looked through God's word, we've found three important steps to living beyond our regrets. And again, these are three steps clear throughout scripture, but if we don't actually apply them, if we don't actually live these out, they don't really make much of a difference. The first thing we've talked about is that we need to recognize our regrets. It means getting honest. It means stop trying to keep them below the surface. It's owning those things that we've done or said or thought, those things that have happened in our life. Then number two, we need to be willing to release our regrets. It's one thing to recognize it, but if we hold on to it too tightly, well, then we still have that pain present in our life. Now, when we release our regrets, it always comes down to forgiveness. It might mean asking for forgiveness from someone or from God, or it might mean giving forgiveness to someone. And forgiveness is always related to confession. When we're willing to confess, God is faithful, and he forgives us all of our sins. Then last week, we talked about redeeming our regrets. Now, this is something we can't do. It's something that only God is able to do. But with the power and the grace of God, he's able to come in and take even the most painful situations, even the most regretful regrets, and he's able to bring something good out of them. In fact, it's a promise that he makes. God is able to redeem even the most painful and hurtful things for good. So we've been in this series for four weeks. We've looked at some biblical stories that illustrate each one of these things. We talked about Peter, one of Jesus' best friends, who just blew it big time. He denied Jesus three different times, betrayed his friend in his moment of need. But later on, we see how Jesus brings forgiveness and restoration to Peter. And not only that, he redeems him by giving him a mission. And Peter became, becomes one of the key leaders in the early church. And then we talked about King David, this great hero from the Bible, celebrity all over the world. And he commits adultery and then murder. And then he tries to cover it up. But when he's confronted by God through a prophet, he says, I confess I've sinned against the Lord, and God begins his redeeming work, and he's given forgiveness, and he's redeemed, and his redemption comes through the birth of his son Solomon, 
And through his family tree, eventually, we receive the gift of our Savior, Jesus. God is able to take a huge mess, a lot of big regrets, and he's able to work them for good. He's able to bring redemption. Now, it's not only true for these biblical figures, it's also true for us. It's something that we can experience and we can live out in our everyday lives. When we follow that example of recognizing and then releasing and allowing God to redeem. Now, I've heard some great stories from people here at Calvary throughout the series. People have shot emails to me or took me aside on a Sunday morning or a Thursday night and they said, you know, I went and I had a conversation I was really afraid to. Or I went and I apologized somebody to somebody that I hurt decades ago. And I'm able to get rid of this regret. And it's been awesome to hear these stories. But I also know, even though many of us have taken some steps forward, that finally experiencing that freedom that God wants for us can be very difficult. Because at the last minute, as we're about to release our regret, it's so easy to grab it and put it back in our pocket. It's so easy to take it back for a variety of reasons. And I think that's the truth for many of us here today. It's one thing to hear about these steps. It's another thing to actually apply them. You might still be haunted by a choice you once made. You might still be reliving the words that you said to someone maybe the last time you saw him. You might still be thinking about that relationship that you torpedoed, and maybe the pain you caused someone, maybe the damage that you did, and that regret is still as fresh as ever. So today, what I want to do as we close this series is I want to take one more shot at helping you move beyond your regrets, no matter where you are at. One more time to talk about what does this look like to put it into practice, to take God's word, and to live it out. So we're going to look at three questions to ask if you are feeling hopeless and stuck with your regrets. So the first question you always need to ask when you feel that regret coming back is instead of recognizing my regret, am I turning a blind eye to them? Instead of recognizing my regrets, Am I turning a blind eye to them? Now, we do this for a variety of reasons. Sometimes we just want to ignore them, think, you know, I'll put them on the back burner. I'll get to it later. Sometimes it's out of laziness. I have so much on my schedule, so many things to do. I can't even think about putting energy or effort towards dealing with these things from the past. Other times, we might just be discouraged. You know, I already experienced so much pain. I already hurt enough people. I mean, to try to surface this again, it's just going to hurt that much more. But I think the biggest reason that we oftentimes don't want to recognize and own our regrets is simply out of fear. You know, it means I'm going to have to pick up the phone and call someone. It's going to be super uncomfortable. It might mean that I have to admit that I'm wrong. Man, I hate to do that. It might mean apologizing. It might mean trying to relive something that happened in the past another time. And it's just, you know, a fearful thing. We're afraid of what this is going to look like. If this is you, know that you're not alone. It's a natural way to feel. Sometimes dealing with regret is like pulling a Band-Aid off. There's definitely some pain involved. But you know what? The short-term pain is so much better than the long-term hurt when we refuse to deal with those regrets in our life. Now, a great example of this that we're going to look at today is the Apostle Paul. Paul is one of the most influential people in all of Christianity. He wrote a majority of the New Testament. He's the greatest evangelist to ever live. Yet he, too, experienced a lot of regret. So today, we're going to camp out in Acts chapter 22. If you have your Bibles or your Bible app or your tablet or whatever you have to interact with Scripture, I'd invite you to turn to Acts chapter 22. Now, to start with a story, we're going to look at verse 4 from Acts 22. And what you need to remember is that Paul had a lot of baggage with him. Paul had a lot of regret. In fact, he was kind of like a first century Al Capone. Like, he was running the resistance against Christians. And he was not a nice guy at all. In fact, he persecuted Christians in very devious ways. 
And not only that, he was responsible for killing many Christians. And his reputation was known far and wide. And so Paul was living with a ton of regret. But the thing is, once he was converted to Christianity, and once he became an advocate for the gospel, as he wrote letters throughout the New Testament, as he encouraged the churches and individuals in their faith, he was open and honest about what he had done. He didn't try to hide anything. In fact, it's amazing how vulnerable and honest that Paul is time and time again. He didn't let his hurt get in the way. Instead, he pointed people to the redemption that God had worked in his life. So if you look at Acts 22, starting with verse 4, he comes right out and says, I persecuted the followers of the way. And if you don't know, the followers of the way was the early title given for the Christian church. I persecuted followers of the way, hounding some to death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The high priest and the whole council of elders can testify this is so. It's like, if you don't believe how big a creep I was, go ask these officials. They'll tell you what I did. He says, for I received letters from them to our Jewish brothers in Damascus, authorizing me to bring the followers of the way from there to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. Now just pause there for a moment, because I think this is a great proof for the truth of the Bible. Because what other philosophy or religion would take one of their heroes and be that honest about what they have done? I mean, everybody else would whitewash the story, but here Paul is like, hey, let me list all the ways that I fell short. I'm going to tell you all of my sins, and if you don't believe me, go check with anyone else. It's amazing how honest the Bible is about who these people we read about are. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth at one time in 1 Corinthians, and he put it really starkly. He said, for I am the least of all of the apostles. Again, this hero of the faith, I'm the least of the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. Paul doesn't try to deny his regret. He owns them publicly to be written down forever. And you know what? If we want to truly start over, if we want to find freedom, we too have to recognize our regrets. We can't be content to turn a blind eye to them. Instead, we need to face them head on. Well, the next question we need to ask ourselves is instead of releasing my regrets, am I still holding on to them? You know, oftentimes when we start to deal with regret, we might start to hand it over to God. And then at the last minute, we grab it again and we stuff it in our pocket, we stuff it away, and we don't actually release it. It's so much easier to just hold on tightly because then we can feel like we're in control. Now, sometimes our regrets definitely feel like wounds, but sometimes wounds can actually feel like a security blanket. Have you ever experienced that before? We can get so comfortable with the pain and the hurt in our life that it can almost be, make us afraid of releasing it because it becomes our new normal. That pain and that adversity and that struggle becomes just like a security blanket, and so we hold on tightly. You maybe have heard of a guy named Anthony Bourdain. He's one of the great celebrity chefs in our country, and he had a lot of different television shows and wrote best-selling books. He was notorious for his hard living, drinking, drugs, working in crazy restaurant environments. And last year, he committed suicide at the age of 61. But right before he committed suicide, he was interviewed for a magazine article. And the author, the interviewer, asked him the question, do you have any regrets? And listen to his answer, because I think it's so common in our culture today. He says, regret is something you just have to live with. You can't drink it away. You can't run away from it. You can't trick yourself out of it. You've got to just own it. I've disappointed and hurt people in my life, and it's just something I'm going to always have to live with. You eat that guilt, and you live with it. 
and you own it, and you own it for life. What a hopeless thought. He's got the first step down, he's recognizing it, but then he's holding on to it tightly. He refuses to let it go. But it's so common in people today. Now the Apostle Paul was finally willing to release his sins and his regrets. And he was willing to experience freedom, but it came through a man named Ananias. Now Jesus showed up to Paul on the road to Damascus, and Paul had a life-changing experience. He was transformed. But then Ananias came to help disciple him and challenge him. And what Ananias finally says to Paul in verse 16 is, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. And in that moment, Paul experienced that God's grace and his love and his mercy is so much bigger than any of our regrets And that all he needed to do was open up his hands and hand it over and God's redeeming power flooded into his life. Paul was willing to release his grip on his regret and to surrender to God's grace. Church, when we let go of our regret, it means saying, Jesus, I trust it to your care. I'm going to give it up to you. Have your way in my life. Scripture tells us when we are baptized, we're baptized into Christ's death and resurrection. It means all of our sin is put to death and we're raised to new life and we are heirs to everything he has. We're adopted into his family and it means you have a new identity and it means when God looks upon you, you've been made as white as snow. And this isn't through anything that we can do. It's not anything we earn. It's not anything we merit. It's simply received by grace. Church, maybe today you need to be reminded of your true identity. Maybe today you need to be reminded of God's promises that are there for you to claim. Stop allowing the enemy to distract you, to tell you lies, to try to convince you that you're not worthy or you're somehow disqualified. God used a murderer like Paul, and he can use someone like you and me. One more question if you find yourself feeling stuck. Instead of redeeming my regrets, am I resisting redemption? Instead of letting God redeem my regrets, am I resisting redemption? You see, the amazing thing about what God wants to do in our lives is he doesn't want to just stop short. He wants to follow through all the way to full restoration and full redemption. He wants to move us beyond all of our regrets. And in fact, he wants to use our pain and our hurt and our mistakes to bring hope and to bring healing to other people. Now with Paul, God used his regrets and he used his guilt and his shame to bring hope to billions of people throughout history. Over 2,000 years, his words have been read and shared, and people have come to faith because of his witness. But listen to Paul as he continues the story in Acts 22, starting in verse 17. He says, After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple, and I fell into a trance. I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, Hurry, leave Jerusalem, for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. But Lord, I argued, they certainly know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And I was in complete agreement when your witness Stephen was killed. I stood by and I held the coats that they took off when they stoned him. Now you need to notice something here. Even after Paul had experienced God's grace and forgiveness, Even in this moment, as God is giving him a great mission, regret starts to creep back in. Did you notice it? He says, but God, and he argues, God, don't you remember who I am? God, don't you remember my history? Don't you remember all the ways that I failed? I don't think you got the right guy, God. Maybe give the job to someone else, more worthy, more qualified. You know what? I think we so often fall into the same trap. 
We're tempted to go right back to the sorry cycle, just like Paul. But notice God's response. It's so succinct and so powerful. He turns to Paul and he says, go. Forget all that. Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Go. Stop arguing. Forget the sorry cycle. Forget your regrets. Go. I've got a huge mission. Don't just stay in your own community. Don't just stay in your own country even. You're going to be responsible for bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. You're going to be responsible for millions and billions of people coming to faith all around the world. I've already redeemed you. Don't go backwards. Don't be stuck. I'm going to give you a great mission and a great responsibility. So next time regret starts to resurface in your life, what will you do? Instead of resisting the work of God, will you let him redeem you? The next time you find yourself stuck in the sorry cycle, remember what God has taught us throughout this series. And you know what? Instead of a sorry cycle, we can turn it into a starting over cycle. We can find a new path so that we can find freedom. Just remember step one. Recognize your regrets. Stare it right in the face. Own up to it. Be honest. Be vulnerable. Next, release your regret. Seek or ask forgiveness. Confess your struggle to God. Leave your regret at the foot of the cross and don't put it back into your pocket. And then number three, finally, let God redeem your regrets. Let him bring something good out of the pain, something you can't even imagine. Sometimes it takes way longer than we wish it would, but God promises that he works all things for good for those who are called according to his purposes. God can work it for good, often in ways that we could never, ever imagine. Now, the thing about this starting over cycle is it's not just a one-time deal. It's not just something we work once and then we're done and we're good to go. No, actually, this is a lifestyle. It's something that we can put into practice, something we can apply every day of our life. Do you wake up in the morning or you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel like that regret is coming back? You go right back into this cycle. Recognize, release, redeem. Recognize, release, redeem. Every day you can apply what we've learned about moving past our regrets. Now the prophet Jeremiah wrote one of the great promises of the Bible in the book of Lamentations in the Old Testament. Many of you have heard this before. It's a great hymn as well. He says, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh every morning. If you have a rough day yesterday, if you wake up and you feel bad about yourself, just remember, great is God's faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh fresh every morning when that regret from your past starts to surface again the faithful love of the lord never ends one last thing using what god has taught us in this series we can live beyond our regrets but the thing is our regrets don't just disappear they recede they lose power they fade over time but they're not fully gone. We know that. We have memories. But what if we could actually erase our regrets forever? What if we could actually erase our regrets for good? Well, that's the ultimate hope and promise that we have in Jesus. Revelation 21 describes this clearly. Where it says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne says, I am making everything new. 
everything will be made new when we go to be with Jesus in heaven. There will be no more regrets from the past and there will be no more regrets in the future. Regrets of action, gone. There's no more hurting anyone. Regrets of inaction, gone. There will be no more missed opportunities. Regrets of reaction, gone. No one will ever hurt us again. There will be no regrets in heaven, period. No more sorrow, no more death, no more tears, only joy and celebration and freedom. Today, you have the opportunity to claim all the promises of God through Jesus. Today, you have the opportunity to start living beyond your regrets. But not only that, by faith and trust in Jesus, you can look forward to the day when there will be absolutely no more regret. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your faithfulness, for your mercy that's new every day.